transition to Talos Teixeira. Talos, thank you for joining us. He is the co-founder of Decoupling.co, and from what I could tell on Amazon, a prolific author as well. So Talos, thanks for joining us. I'm going to share a little bit on unlocking the customer value chain. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for the, the introduction and uh, Stelios for the invitation. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, very briefly about a few aspects of my book that came out a couple of years ago, and I'll present a little bit of what I've been doing since then. So uh, um, as has been said, I am not a full-time faculty anymore. I was a full-time uh, faculty at the Harvard Business School for 10 years. In the first uh, few years uh, of my uh, being there, I did, an air, uh, I did research on this area called the economics of attention, a lot to understand how to capture attention and then use it effectively to build brands and sale. Uh, um, the last few uh, uh, years being at the Harvard Business School, I wrote this book on, on digital disruption, trying to understand it and help big companies respond. So it's called Unlocking the Customer Value Chain. On a personal note, I live uh, today in La Jolla uh, near San Diego. I love sailing. I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, but uh, basically what I did is I paused my academic career since launching the book because many companies have asked for advice or consulting. And I started going into practice and helping these uh, big companies. And the types of engagement that I do are helping big companies design startups. And I'll show you a little bit about what this means. Uh, helping all companies, startups and big companies, uh, do what I call customer-centric innovation as opposed to firm-centric innovation, what is beneficial for the firm, looking at customers, as well as I do a series of workshops on new business models, developing, designing business models for uh, big companies and small startups alike. Uh, basically, what I'd like to talk a little bit today is a little bit about what customer-centric digital disruption means. But before that, uh, I'd just like to explain what is disruption. What is, when we talk about it, uh, many people are not really clear. I have a very clear definition. I observe digital disruption when I enter a market, when I visit startups or tech companies, and I see something, two things happen. First, uh, there are substantial changes in market shares, and second, in a short time span. So big companies, what we call incumbents, lose 10, 20, 30, 40 percentage points of market share in a relatively short period of time, sometimes less than 10 years, seven or even five years. And who steals these, uh, these market share from these incumbents? These are the startups and tech companies. Really, I really try to understand what is this phenomenon, how it happens, how can startups disrupt markets more efficiently, and how can big companies respond to this uh, imminent attack? But you know, historically, when we talk about digital disruption, we talk about the innovators, lots of tech innovators, uh, um, innovation, innovative technologies, disruptive technologies. But there are many, many examples of big companies that created a lot of new technologies like Nokia and like EMI Scanner, like Xerox, like Kodak, that actually had fallen, are in the process of dying, have, have uh, reduced their footprint, or have gone bankrupt. So uh, I really put into question this idea that disruptive technologies is the cause of disruption. Differently, I really take much more customer-centric mindset. And I start off with a customer value chain. What is a customer value chain? Suppose you're this consumer and you're buying headphones or, or a phone. You need to understand that you go through a process that is called the customer value chain of uh, becoming aware that you need a product, shopping, comparing, choosing, acquiring the product, using the product, repurchasing or disposing of the product. And when you look at this customer value chain, all customer value chains, no matter what you sell, no matter who's your customer, they can be classified into one of three types. Either are value creating activities where consumers actually get benefit by using the product, by being aware that they need a product, for example, insurance, there are also value capture activities. This is how you pay for the company. This is how companies capture value from consumers. And there's other activities that are what we would call value eroding activities. So in this case, for example, uh, shopping, choosing, uh, uh, these are activities that consumers are, have to do, but in and of themselves, these activities don't create value. What creates value are the value creating activities. So once you realize that all customer value chain activities can, divide, can be divided in these three types, the next step is really understanding for your business, where are your customers happy and where are they unhappy? So what we do is we use the net promoter score to ask customers, not at the end of the journey, but throughout the process of buying and using goods and services. And what we see is, here's an example of one of my clients. First, we see peaks in 
the NPS scores over across the, the, the journey. So these peaks is what we call strong links. It's where customers are extremely happy and satisfied with these activities. In this case, choosing and using the products. These were strong links. At the same time, what you see is uh, that uh, in other parts of this uh, customer value chain, customers aren't really that satisfied with the companies. This is what we call weak links. These are the low points in the customer satisfaction or NPS across the customer value chain. So to give you a few examples, uh, uh, with Marriott Hotels, you have a specific customer value chain of comparing options of hotels, reserving, traveling, checking in, entering the room, and checking out. And the NPS across the customer value chain revealed to us that the weak link where customers are most unhappy is that people hate filling out unnecessary information uh, in order to see the rates and to reserve a room. They take, it takes time. Sometimes they have to fill out. They're unhappy in that activity. Over time, as they go through the journey, the highest point of satisfaction with Marriott customers is they love that first moment of entering their clean room and sitting or lying down, putting their luggage down. That's the peak. So as you can see here, if you want to uh, understand where customers are, uh, are most happy or where you should ask them for things, it's not necessarily at the end because then after they leave and they check out, maybe their NPS doesn't increase over time. That might have been the peak. In the case of Nissan, I traveled to Japan and I wrote a Harvard case on Nissan. What we realized is customers, particularly women, were very unhappy in the process of negotiating with salespeople. That was the weakest link of Nissan dealers. Now, on the other hand, obviously they love driving off the lot. That first time that you drive off a brand new car with a smell, that was a strong link. In a case of a payments company in Brazil, uh, the weak link was people hate filling out personal information to sign up for an account. That was the weak link. And the strong link was they love seeing that credit to their account for the first time that they use it, right? And so when you look generically, any, any business can do this, whether you're a startup or an incumbent company, you can map out the customer value chain, all the important activities, and then you can measure satisfaction across these activities, realize the strong links and the weak links. What do you do with the strong links? Well, obviously with the strong links, you really want to leverage these strong links. How can you leverage them? Well, for one, you can ask customers to review you or your company, your brand, your product, because if it's a strong link, that chances are that after they do that activity, that's when they will provide the highest reviews. Also, you can ask them for recommendations, recommend my company, my brand, my product to your acquaintances. Asking that immediately after a strong link will increase the chances that you'll get those recommendations. So that's how you leverage the, long, uh, the strong links. By the way, if you need to increase prices, when do you do it? When customers are unsatisfied? Bad idea. You should do it right after strong link. Now, what about the weak links? When you identify these weak links, what do you do afterwards? Well, this is what we do. Obviously, these are the weak links. Once you identify it, you need to improve where it is low. Very, very clear and very obvious. You want to try to kind of increase the, the satisfaction in these activities. And when you do that, you will increase the overall satisfaction of your customers. And therefore, that will increase the chances that well, you'll acquire more customers. You'll retain these customers. You'll get them to be loyal. And you will avoid being disrupted by other startups trying to do these activities better. Now, how do you improve that? There's a variety of ways. You know, if you do consumer surveys, you can, you can uh, ask and understand and learn a variety of ways to improve the satisfaction of customers with your products or services. But overall, after doing this for many, many different co companies and industries, what I've realized that customers are looking for three things. And so can you make that activity cheaper for them to do? Can you make it faster for them to do? Or can you make it easier for them to do? If you focus on these three levers to improve your weak links in any business that you are, in any activity that customers go through, chances are you will significantly increase the NPS score on those weak links. And more recently with COVID, in some cases, this fourth lever is really making it safer for customers. So if you do that, you will increase those weak links. And I've done that for a variety of companies in very specific manners. But if you look at these companies, very different industries, different countries, different uh, uh, verticals, different products and services, 
they all have benefit by making it cheaper, faster, easier for their customers to actually pass through, execute a weak link activity. Now, the big challenge is that when I looked at decoupling disruption going in many industries, I've identified this phenomenon that I call decoupling the customer value chain. Essentially startups, instead of trying to replicate everything that a incumbent does, they go for the weak links. They try to make it steal that activity from incumbent companies and steal those customers on those activities. Instead of doing everything, they just try to help customers execute those activities, the weak links better. And so when you have established company and you have weak links and you can't just naturally improve them significantly over time, what I help my clients do is create disruptive startups to address those weak links that can't automatically and quickly be improved just by small changes. Something more dramatic, something bigger needs to be done. And that's when we enter the realm of digital transformation. Established companies have had weak links for many, many years. For a variety of reasons, they find it very challenging to improve the satisfaction with customers on those weak links. Then we need to do something more egregious, more transformative that affects other parts of the organization, right? And so what I help them do is figuring out a new business model by changing the target customer, changing the channels, changing the prices, the digital uh, technologies and the user experience, but more importantly, aligning all of these levers in order to improve customer satisfaction and recommendation. Once we do that, we create a customer centric business model that is more favorable, more adapt at benefiting for the digital age. And once that is done once, we need to keep adapting and aligning all of these decisions. And that creates a virtual cycle that improves over time, the relationship with companies and their customers, and that causes them to grow and defend themselves from startups or tech companies that are trying to attack and steal those weak links. So uh, just to summarize a little bit of what I said and the broader tenets of what are behind this methodology that can be used both for startups to disrupt big companies as well as for established companies to defend themselves from startups. I've come to read and learn and listen to so many people, executives, consultants. And I've come to realize that once you go into looking at these businesses, what is really going on, there's three myths that I've I'm gonna try to correct uh, right now. First, once I looked at companies and customers of these companies that were using Amazon app to buy online, those companies a few years ago, those customers were more likely to adopt Uber when Uber came out. And those customers that adopted Uber and Amazon were much more likely to adopt Birchbox. And when they used these three apps, they were more likely than others to adopt Airbnb and so on and so forth. The point that I'm saying here is the process of digital disruption, consumers adopt these apps. And once they take a flavor, a liking for it, they go into many other industries. And so what we're starting to see is the clear picture of what is behind digital disruption. So one of the key tenets is customers disrupt markets, not startups. It's not startups that are better, faster. They have better technologies. They're, the startups tend to succeed because they can identify and then build a customer-centric business model much faster than established companies. And so they deliver for the changing customer needs and wants. So whatever you have changing customer needs and respective changes in behaviors, you can bet that there's an opportunity for customer-centric disruption. The second point is this. There's so many new technologies. Every six months, there's something new. 3D printer, AR, VR, Bitcoin, wearables, blockchain, so on and so forth. Executives are actually flabbergasted. There's not enough time to really read and understand all these technologies and something new comes about. Luckily, they don't need to do this deep dive learning of technologies in detail. Why? Because the business, the disruptive ingredient is business model innovation, not technology alone. Technology is important, but it's a motor that if you put this motor into a good business model, this will create a cycle of growth. 
But if the business model is bad, you put a motor on it, it will spiral out of control and blow up. The third and final point is professors and consultants like me and gurus, we all have the answers. This I've taken out the internet from other consulting companies. This is the, the wheel of trust data UX. This is the digital leadership wheel. This is the other form of, of, of framework that is available. You can see that they're all uh, round and they're all colorful. If you don't like circular shapes, there are other frameworks for you in the internet. There's a triangle. There is a, a, a diamond model of digital transformation. There's the hexagon and my favorite, the honeycomb model of digital disruption. This is all nonsense. This is all not valuable, whether you're a startup or a incumbent executive. What really is, is there's a common approach to digital disruption. And this common approach relies understanding what is the customer value chain? Where are the strong and the weak links? And the weak links create opportunities for startups to attack and steal and threats for established companies to have to defend or else they'll lose them, okay? So much of my book talks about this process in more detail. This is what I call decoupling. Startups are decoupling the customer value chain and stealing weak links. And this is the entry strategy by which startups are gaining a foothold or market, entering the beach and then expanding uh, their footprint. That has happened with many, many startups. If you look at Alibaba, if you look at Amazon, if you look at PayPal, if you look at Netflix, this is what they've been doing, okay? So uh, this is me. Uh, this is my book, Unlocking the Customer Value Chain. Uh, if you're interested, please go uh, uh, read it uh, or, or, or follow me. Um, and uh, I hope this was useful, interesting. In a short amount of time, I wanted to give you a broad sense of what's been going on in a variety of markets, a variety of world. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Carlos, thank you very much. I, I um, one thing I took away from that is I finally figure out what that spinny color wheel is on my MacBook. It's it's a consultant <laughs> customer value explanation on, on, the, on their website. <laughs> really quickly, I've got one question that, that I want I wanted to ask you before we transition to the next speaker is when companies don't just publish the low point in their in their value chain online. How do you identify that? What's the quick, easy, dirty answer to how a startup would identify what the low points are in the value chain? Uh, that's Kevin. Uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, uh, one of the easiest way is to ask ask your customers, right? Just ask your customers. Ask very simply, and that's why I like the NPS question. How likely are you to uh, um, recommend my company? The problem is that companies wait for a customer to, in a case of hotels, you know, wait for the customer to compare options, book, check in, visit the hotel, use a restaurant, check out. A week later, a few days later. You shouldn't ask your customers after, at the end of the experience, what did they feel about everything? You should ask different customers at different points in time in their journey. And with that, you can get a clear sense of where your weak links are. And uh, make no mistake, if, if you don't know them, definitely uh, entrepreneurs, my students, at Harvard or I'm teaching at the University of California, they're trying to figure out weak links across a variety of big companies. And so you should probably know this uh, before uh, my students or else uh, if you work in an established company, uh, you'll be in serious risk. But you know, asking is always one of the best and easiest ways. Just make it simple and don't make it often. Nobody likes to be surveyed that many times. Alice, thank you so much for, for joining us today. What a great presentation.